Hey, uh, welcome all of you ever curious Hurley Burleyites. You are listening to the only political podcast in Canada that brings back our most popular guests when it serves these two criteria. One, when it's timely and relevant. Two, when we really need to fill an open slot. And now, hot on the heels of Frances Donald making her third appearance on the Hurley Burley, we have John Stackhouse making his third appearance on the pod. Here's what the data says. John's first appearance, way back in January of 2020, ranks as number 10 in our top 10 most listened to episodes of all time. John spent close to a quarter century at the Globe and Mail as a foreign correspondent, editor of the report on business, and then finally editor-in-chief. Today, he's a senior vice president, office of the CEO at the Royal Bank of Canada, where he advises leadership on emerging trends in the economy. He sees into the future, ladies and gentlemen, early Burleyites. And guess what? He just got back from the Conference of the Parties Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, COP26. Timely, relevant. So we're going to talk about climate change and the economy and maybe touch on housing prices, interest rates, and inflation. we got a lot to do here. John, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for coming. David, thanks for, for having me. And after that introduction, I have only one question, and that is, who cancelled? <laughs> exactly no we just we just got lazy <laughs> no no it's true it's it's wonderful just? to have you back we we've known each other for such a long time and your experience is so broad um i really love talking to you because i think we see the world through kind of similar glasses but you know a lot of shit so it's great to talk to you because i learned from it <laughs> so you hey, just, just jump back to the cop Correction. Yeah. So I, yeah, I wasn't ahead. in Glasgow, but you know, in this uh, COVID age, um, it, it's it's all virtual all the time. So was able to be there virtually and uh, save the emissions. Oh, you weren't actually hanging around in the corridors. No, no, thirty thousand people point to hanging around in, in the quarters. Well, I guess it depends what you're trying to get out of it. I, I'm still trying to get my head around thirty thousand people in a <clears throat> city of six hundred thousand. That's five five percent. Right. Imagine thirty thousand people, or more, landing in Saskatoon or Regina. Uh, yeah, they'd have to. That'd be a great day for pickup truck sales. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to pickup tr truck sales. <laughs> so, um, what was Canada's role <clears throat> at COP? Significant? Was Canada doing? Yeah. We had a big delegation. Not the biggest, I told, but big. What what did we accomplish over there? Yeah, Canada's a serious actor in, in in climate, and I think a lot of what we're doing on policy is of of strong interest to uh, to other countries. We're a bridge country in lots of ways, very unique, like a, a resource producer, exporting country that's part of the G seven, part of the G twenty, uh, a democracy. All that uh, all that matters, and unfortunately, is becoming rare. Error, uh, in in some parts of of the world. So whether it's what we're doing on carbon pricing, uh, what we are doing on uh, fuel standards, on uh, emissions policy, which I'm sure we'll get into, is is really significant for a lot of the world. For just the opportunity to share uh, is, is important, but also to bring like-minded countries together shouldn't be undervalued. Because one of the things I, I found fascinating, concerning out of COP is the, the, the growing and very evident divide in the world, especially between democracies and authoritarian states. So obviously the US and China. That's gonna be maybe the biggest challenge to climate change policy over the decade decades so, ahead. Can this be managed by both democracies and authoritarian regimes in a somehow synchronized way? We'll see. Can I get you to expand on that a little? Because I, I thought you were going to say that the big divide was developing versus developed. But yeah, you're saying it's democracies versus authoritarian. What is that about? What's the divide there? Well, democracies are wrestling with how to, to how to carry out and be effective on climate policy because these are these are long term policies um, by by their very nature. They're inherently long term and therefore need to transcend 
political cycles, uh, which, which are the foundation of, uh, of operational democracy. We see that in this country. You see it in spades in the U.S. So can countries make long-term commitments? And this is something business wonders about because we're – We'll talk about the tens of billions of dollars a year of investment that's going to be required. Can investors make those sorts of investments knowing that governments change, policies meander, uh, but will there be a kind of a di- directional commitment in a democracy like Canada or or the U.S.? That's, that's going to be one of our tests in the years ahead. Then you have authoritarian states like China uh, is probably exhibit A, that feel they're able to say, look, we can make a 25-year plan and the same regime is going to be here 25 years from now. So there's a lot more certainty. Okay, on the surface, that has an intriguing appeal perhaps to certain actors, including investors, but there's all sorts of uh, challenges under the surface there, uh, including real effectiveness on uh, on the ground, the sustainability of especially private capital flows uh, over over that kind of period. So this is this this is the tension of our times. Okay, so before we get into the some of the issues that emerge from it, I'd love to get your overall take. I read the RBC report on COP that you circulated on Twitter, um, and. Um, it was trying to find silver linings in clouds, I thought, is what that report was trying to do. But what's your personal take? There, there, there was, I, I mean, people are often being asked now, was it a good cop or bad cop? And I, I find that's a bit primary <laughs> because it was, uh, I, I'm trying to riff off of kindergarten cop, but not quite finding the, uh, the, the way to make that work. Um, you know, it was a mixed cop. Uh, there was a lot of good in it, uh, a lot of operational good, commitments on methane, for instance, on deforestation. Those are significant. I mean, in some ways, they're words. You know, Credit Thunberg really nailed it with blah, blah, blah. There was a lot of blah, blah, blah. Um, but those steps, whether they're incremental uh, or more significant, uh, do matter. Uh, so let's not, uh, let's not under, un- underestimate, uh, underestimate that. The fact that the world is continuing to lean into this Close to 200 countries is 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 not to be under underrated. That's that's important. But step back and look at the big picture. Um, we have very serious commitments to reach by 2050 and by 2030, and we are not on course to meet them. There was not enough coming out of Glasgow that gives a lot of um, confidence. I think in uh, in the world that we're going to hit those uh, hit those targets on current course, especially 2030. Uh, national commitments uh, are pretty loose still. Uh, too many governments are trying to punt it down the road. Give us another year. Give us another couple of years. Uh, or as um, you know, the Indians, uh, Chinese are saying, or Russia, you know, give us another decade. We'll get there by 2060 or 2070. Um, you know, with with those sorts of messages coming out of COP, it's uh, it's hard to have conviction that we're on the course that we need to be on to get certainly to 2030. And that comes out in, you know, it gets it gets very technical. And I fear we may be losing listeners here when we talk about the difference between 1.5 and 2. Um, but, you know, we're, we're on course to be, you know, closer to 2, maybe above 2 degrees warming. Uh, rather than the the, the Paris goal of 1.5, that may sound like you know fractional uh, changes. At, at, at two degrees, we lose coral um, everywhere. So that needs to be. I think we need to pause and just say, okay, coming out of Glasgow, we're on current course to say goodbye to coral. Um, so let's let's be aware of that and understand that that's one of one of many consequences. And if we want to avoid that. What do we really need to come to grips with? Um, and that's, you know, that's the the hard work now that uh, that comes out of uh, comes out of Glasgow. Now, given given history, what discount do you apply to the promises made by countries at COP? Oh, lots. Lots. I mean, I, I'm uh, old enough to have uh, been around at the first COP, and, and actually spent a lot of time with. Uh, you'll remember Morris Strong, sort of a great Canadian, uh, in the 70s and 80s, who who really 
founded COP in many ways and got the Rio Earth Summit going, uh, which he led. Uh, he was the founder of the United Nations Environment Program in the in the 1970s, and I spent a lot of time with him 30 plus years ago writing about uh, his worldview and what was emerging around the Rio Earth Summit. And you know, I, I often pause and think about the ambitions. Uh, he's since left us. Um, but you know what what the world set out to do at Rio, we have not achieved. Uh, and we need to reflect on that. If, if we've been trying, 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 talking, talking, talking for 30 years and we're still off course, um, what do we need to uh, course correct? Okay. So the American political system is a complete fucking mess. So let's look at China. The Chinese government, if you could peer into their minds, do they not believe the science or do they think the science is overly pessimistic and there's more latitude or are they just prepared to live with the consequences? I think they believe the science. I think they understand and hear it from their own citizens, the consequences of climate change, whether it is uh, urban uh, pollution, which is horrific in many Chinese cities or flooding uh, or extreme weather as we see here. China's, you know, it's one climate for one world. Uh, China is suffering all that. And, you know, they, they understand that uh, from an economic and social uh, point of view. They also understand the opportunities here, that China can be a leader in the uh, climate technology revolution and can turn that into a massive export opportunity. That's a really interesting race that's emerging, uh, particularly between the US and, and, and China. And again, we get back to, to models. Is state capitalism, i.e. China, going to be the right way to go for technologies around electric vehicles or, uh, or electricity storage uh, or maybe even um, small uh, nuclear reactors? Or is the more kind of freewheeling American capitalist system going to uh, do for climate technology what it did for the internet uh, and software over the last uh, 30 years? That's going to be really uh, powerful in terms of uh, determining the world's uh, success on the on, on on the tech front. So I think China sees this as an opportunity, but they're they're also I think being very clever diplomatically understanding uh, the U.S. political system as you uh, described it, knowing that maybe they can steal a beat uh, as, as the U.S. Uh, struggles with, uh, with many, of these, uh, many of these issues, and maybe can buy a bit of time on the, uh, on the adjustment. So saying, you know, maybe 2060, talking about uh, carbon peaking at uh, 2030, but they're adding a lot of coal production a lot of coal production right now and will continue through this decade on current course. And they're saying, look, coal, we need coal because that's what is going to power our economic growth and we are entitled to that economic growth that you enjoyed in the decades past um, and all your historic carbon is sitting up there in the atmosphere. Maybe you should come to grips with that as we do, uh, do a bit of catch up. That's gonna be a, an enormous tension especially between the US and uh, China in the, uh, in the next political cycle. Will China be allowed? Why do they have to build? Why do they have to burn coal? Uh, Because it's cheap. Why why aren't? What's wrong with nuclear for China and India? Well, uh, nuclear is expensive, um, but uh, that's certainly an option. Why don't we pay for it? Coal coal, coal is. Why don't we pay for it for India? Like, why um, don't we pay for it for India? Or, or Bangladesh. Uh, that's a big okay. uh, a, a big question on the table. Uh, coal, which is, is is rightly vilified, is still really cheap, convenient, easy, uh, and available. Uh, so if you need to produce energy for a city that is growing by a million people, uh, maybe in a, a year or over five years, coal is probably the, the first option you're going to look at. Um, it's not the right option. Uh, for climate reasons, but for economic and social reasons, uh, it is still very convenient. So that's why India and China are uh, are, are are turning to it. It also tends to be state owned uh, or state controlled in many countries. So there's a whole political dynamic. This is especially true in India around the coal industry. Um, so why don't we pay for their transition? Well, that has been on the table since I talked to Morris Strong about this. 30 years ago, his view was we need a historic economic transfer 
from wealthy countries to developing countries to do the sorts of things that, that you've just said, to pay for newer, cleaner uh, energy so we don't deprive those countries of economic growth. Voters in developing countries appear not to be willing to sign up for and, and ultimately pay for that massive transfer. We'll pay for a little bit of it, uh, but we're struggling with $100 billion a year. The sorts of things you're talking about, David, are probably you know, in the, in the, in the range of trillion uh, and taxpayers in the West. Which we just spent this year for a pandemic. This is going to wipe out the species. <laughs> well, if you put it that way, it seems like a bargain. Uh, but uh, um, it's uh, it, 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 it's uh, not a message that seems to resonate with uh, with the with the general public. And and it's it's actually a really important point, David, because with COVID, we had a clear present danger and risk to our survival, and we struggle with things like vaccines and masks and whether we can do that collectively as a society. Climate certainly is an existential threat, but it's not as immediate, say, as a, a, a virus that could kill you uh, today or next year. And how do we go about politics and collective decision making differently, knowing that we really struggle with some of these short-term decisions when the short-term benefits are evident. How are we going to get us all to make behavioral changes, to make economic changes, and the world to come to grips with some of those transfers as you've described them when the benefit isn't going to be this year or next year, maybe 25 years from now, or you know, maybe a decade from now? Uh, that's a uh, kind of a circle in politics that's really hard to square. Have you ever used the word bilker, hurly burlyites? A bilker is a person or party who uses clever means to cheat other people out of something of value. Let's see if this situation passes the test. Right now, in rural communities all across Canada, a few billionaire controlled cable companies are not using the government spectrum subsidies to do what they're supposed to do, which is to provide high speed digital connectivity to the good people who live in rural communities. High-speed connectivity is key to delivering proper health care and education. It helps businesses and farmers compete with the latest technology. In short, it helps these communities thrive. I'd say that's something of value. Instead, these companies are using government social policy as an investment tool. They're taking the subsidies and just sitting on them, waiting providing no service, building no infrastructure to help rural communities connect. Eventually, they resell the Spectrum licenses on the secondary market for millions of dollars in profit. Some might call that clever. Others would call it profiteering at the expense of rural Canadians. Sad to say, this is not a one-time loophole. It's happening over and over again. As a technology leader with a social purpose, this is not how our presenting sponsor, TELUS, does business. TELUS believes that if you say you're going to work with government and take their spectrum subsidies for rural Canada, then you have an obligation, a responsibility, to provide that service to rural Canada. To invest in our rural, remote, and Indigenous communities by building cell towers and other infrastructure. Here's a simple way to start. Right now, TELUS could boost service and quality of life to over a quarter million households in Alberta and BC if Spectrum that was being held for profit by others was simply unlocked. Go to telus.com slash connecting Canada to learn more. So former Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall told me that Canada could do more to fight climate change by doing those kinds of technology transfers and spending money doing that <clears throat> than by closing down our oil sands. He's got a point. We need to, you know, we, we've got a lot of serious issues to come to grips with domestically, including all of our consumption. This is not just about what we produce, it's how we and what we consume. But ultimately, regardless of your view, we are half a percent of the world's population. We're much more significant in terms of emissions, but you know, you know, we're not going to be a game changer 
in terms of the world's progress. We can be a really powerful catalyst. Uh, and there's such a huge opportunity here for Canada to develop technologies, whether it's carbon capture or small nuclear uh, reactors, as you mentioned, or hydrogen, not only for our own benefit, and that alone is uh, really important, um, but to export and scale the benefit, economic benefit for Canada, but the climate benefit for the world. So how do we think about some of the big opportunities before us, like carbon capture in the oil sands? and invest in that not only to help accelerate our energy sectors move to net zero, but to create and scale technologies that we can then sell to the world that are going to reduce China's emissions or India's emissions or America's emissions. This is going to be a huge economic opportunity for, for, for Canada, but probably the biggest but the environmentalists we can make. The environmentalists who this government listens to hate nuclear, hate blue hydrogen, and uh, hate carbon capture. Yeah, and that's, uh, that, 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 uh, that creates some real challenges because what do we want that can be scaled and applied in really effective ways in a short period of time, i.e. 10 years? There aren't a lot of choices there and you've just rattled off a few that are there for us to seize on and you know there are shortcomings and questions around those there are shortcomings and questions around all new technologies and i often think back even just 5 years ago to the many people who looked at an emerging company called tesla and said yeah that's not really possible or that's kind of a, a neat little uh fringe experiment and maybe the wealthy will, uh, will, will benefit from it. And no one in the auto industry now even thinks that. Uh, and that's the sort of thinking, the Tesla Tesla thinking changed need, everything. Yeah. And we need to take that sort of thinking to carbon capture or to hydrogen, uh, blue hydrogen, and say, look, there are, there, there, are, there are shortcomings here, there are challenges, but we really need this to work. So let's continue to test and learn, invest, test and learn, and develop it, and make sure we are a world leader in this for our benefit, but also to sell to the world. Carbon capture is moving very, very quickly in the United States and in China. Uh, if we don't move faster than we are, we are going to be buying technology, I suspect, for carbon capture from the US or from others in the years, certainly decades ahead, when, when, when we, we should be making it and selling it to those countries. Okay, that is super interesting. Can I come back to saving the world one last time, though? On this top <laughs> process, how can, how can this process possibly work? Um, there's too many people involved. How do you actually come to a decision about anything? Doesn't this have to end up with China and the United States going away for a few days and coming back and telling all the rest of us what we have to do? Uh, yeah, that's an extreme point, but I think we saw, w one of my takeaways from Glasgow is that we saw a very clear emergence of coalitions of the willing around things like uh, methane or, and deforestation. And the COP process is inherently limited. It, it is all the countries of the world. And this is both the strength and the weakness of the UN. It brings together all the countries pretty much of the world and finds common ground. That's actually really important, but very insufficient. So maybe we need to continue to have that kind of common ground effort, but not emphasize it so much because we need more of these coalitions of the willing on really key issues that can move, um, kind of move, move the dial. I wanted to avoid that cliche, but, uh, but, but get us going. Uh, in very measurable ways on emissions, you know, be it methane or carbon uh, or, or, or other greenhouse gases, um, and not wait for perfection, not wait for unanimity, uh, because we may never get that. We're not going to get it on the kind of the big movers. What you've identified is actually an even more acute challenge to the world. And I often reflect on... Um, 
the nuclear disarmament movement of the 60s and 70s, uh, where th there were many who wanted unanimity in the world on disarmament. But ultimately, it was the U.S. and Soviets, right? They, they had to get together right. uh, in Reykjavik and other places and say, okay, this is what we are going to do. And then everyone else says, great, <laughs> the world's a safer place, um, and now we can move too. And I suspect, David, we not only need, but maybe we're going to see a bit of that in the in 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 the years ahead. One of the biggest things out of Glasgow, it was it was blah blah blah, but it may have a lasting impact. Was the U.S. China agreement? I say blah 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 right. because it was just an agreement to work together. Okay, so that means nothing, but it could also mean everything if they start to act on it. And as we see tensions between the U.S. and China, and those aren't going to ease no matter what happens in the political cycles in the U.S., but maybe climate becomes an area in which they can work uh, together. Maybe they can make commitments uh, around joint emissions reduction, around key technologies uh, like carbon capture or hydrogen, uh, around sharing technologies and I IP um, that the rest of the world can then uh, get, uh, get behind. I, I, I suspect we're going to see a bit more of that, and that could be that could be positive. Right. So last week I told you about the battery electric locomotive our sponsor CN just ordered. It might be hard to imagine batteries powering something that weighs hundreds of tons, but that's the sort of technology CN is considering. The fact is, railroads will need alternate forms of propulsion in the low carbon world we're hurtling toward. And now CN has formally committed to setting a new target, net zero emissions by 2050. Among other things, that means CN intends to eventually stop burning fossil fuels in its fleet. It's pretty clear, especially after the declaration in Glasgow last weekend, that there is still some hesitation among the governments of the world to make expensive, politically difficult commitments. It's also clear that if we're going to keep average temperatures from rising more than one and a half degrees, business is going to have to step up and help lead, which is what CN is doing. It is the first North American railroad to formally commit to setting a net zero target by 2050. CN is now part of the UN's race to zero. It's all a process, as they say. Since 1993, the company has reduced the intensity of its greenhouse gas emissions by 43%, meaning it has avoided more than 48 million tons of emissions. CN also continues to lead other railways in reducing fuel consumption. CN trains consume about 15% less fuel per gross ton mile than the industry average. In 2020, CN achieved its best rate of locomotive fuel efficiency ever, beating the record it had set the year earlier. And as I've pointed out here more than once, rail is already a pretty green way to move heavy freight over land. One train takes hundreds of trucks off of our highways. CN's vision is to serve its customers by creating stronger, more dependable, cleaner North American supply chains. That's what the future demands. And as you know, the future is rushing right at us. What's the Kearney process all about? And as a corollary to that, I've started to believe that nobody will do anything unless there's money in it. So how do we put money into this? How do we harness human greed to solve climate change? Yeah, and I don't see it as human greed, David. Well, you know, I was doing that, it tendentiously but... <laughs> to get your reaction. <laughs> It, it, it's there, there's a logic to money uh, that is often unassailable and very effective. Uh, and when you think about blah, 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 sometimes that needs to be um, countered by the money effect. Uh, and, and when you follow the money positively, you can see really effective change. We've seen that you know, throughout society. You see it in poverty reduction. Uh, you see it in social progress and in, in, in all sorts of fields. And we're going to see it we're already seeing it in climate. Um, so let me get to the Carney process and what he's trying to do with global financial institutions. But I'll uh, share a bit of insight from what we're doing at RBC, uh, maybe to illustrate where things are moving very positively. So a couple of years ago, we committed $100 billion to sustainable finance. That was a huge number. And I remember the discussions at RBC the time. RBC did? Uh, 
RBC, R- RBC did? did? Yeah. Okay. And we thought, okay, is, is there going to be the demand for this? And uh, we thought, well, let's let's see. And within the first year or two, and that was over five years. Within the first year or two, we realized we were going to blow through that number. And so we increased it to $500 billion. And we're not alone in this. Many, many other Global banks are, are are doing the same, although not many at that uh, at that at that level. Um, and, and David, in, in, into year two and three of this, the the demand is doubling every year. Uh, we're going to go through that five hundred billion dollars by twenty twenty five. There is huge demand out there. Uh, governments looking for green bonds um, is uh, is an obvious one, but real estate companies, energy companies. Uh, food producers looking for uh, new ways to finance their own transitions. And if you have a measurable transition plan, not blah, 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 but saying, here's our emissions, uh, we'll get them audited, and uh, we're going to disclose uh, how we're doing. If you can do that as a company, in pretty much every sector now, the cost of capital for you is going to be cheaper. And companies are all over this. Uh, because, you, know, you can call that greed. Uh, I would call it an economic logic, an incentive uh, that is yeah. accelerating change faster than a lot of government action uh, can do. We need both public policy and private action. So what Carney is trying to do is create a global movement uh, for this kind of finance, finance-led transition. Uh, it's complicated stuff. It's different for insurance companies than it is for pension plans than it is for for banks because we all have very different time horizons. But what he has effectively been able to do is to pull together a critical mass of the world's financial institutions, including us um, and all, all major Canadian banks, to commit to financing the transition to net zero. And that's why you get the, the, the big number, the headline number of $140 trillion at Glasgow. That's a bit, uh, I don't want to say an exaggeration because the, 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 the number is accurate. Jenny Byrne tells me it's bigger than the world economy. Yeah, don't, so, so, so don't be misled <laughs> by it. That, that, that's the assets of the financial institutions that are committed to that. That doesn't mean there's $140 trillion sitting um, in an account somewhere right. um, that, that people can suddenly move to, to uh, green activities. But it does show you the, the, the scale of what's what's out there and i you know, wanted to point to those numbers that we're seeing at rbc because the demand is out there as well and that is increasing maybe accelerating in many sectors regardless of what governments are doing that's a really positive thing that was another big change at glasgow there was a lot of business leadership there uh, a lot of leadership from the fi- global financial sector there uh, that Carney was able to bring now, why? together. Now, why? 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 I um, know these people, and I know they're not altruistic. I mean, they're human beings, so they're decent yeah. people, but they got a job, and it's not to be altruistic. So why are because they doing it? They, they see where the puck is going. They see where the economy is going. Uh, they see the opportunity. If you are in the food business, um, you've talked to Michael McCain about this, um, he sees a very clear direction for Maple Leaf Foods, Canada's biggest uh, food company, uh, including opportunities in the uh, in the U.S. Uh, as they transition to net zero, that is a growth opportunity for for him. We see it as um, as, as a client opportunity. That demand is growing, uh, so we're we're responding to it as uh, as a bank. Uh, energy companies have a, a, a clear interest in getting to uh, getting to net zero. They're going to have to invest in a lot of technology uh, to to do that. So there's there's pressure um, and. and Greater pressure in some sectors than uh, than others. That can be that can be positive, but pressure on its own tends not to lead to optimal outcomes. Uh, it tends to lead to defensive outcomes. There is an opportunity, and when you mix those two kind of forces of both pressure from shareholders, from uh, the public, from uh, consumers, from employees, that's that's a motivator for uh, business decision makers. Combine that with the opportunity, and we did the, the report at RBC that 
it looks at the two trillion dollar um, transition over a 25 year period. That's an opportunity if you see that as an investment. And I think a lot of business thinkers, certainly a lot of investors, are seeing this as um, kind of a game changer for the next uh, for the next quarter century. Okay, so speaking speaking about that. I don't think anybody in Canada outside of the Prairie Provinces and maybe Newfoundland has any appreciation for the significance of the oil and gas industry to Canada's economy in terms of jobs in central Canada, in terms of uh, wealth of the country, balance of payments, third of our third of our exports, right? Yep. So does anybody in Canada actually have an idea of what a prosperous Canadian economy looks like after fossil fuels? Or are we just <laughs> operating on faith that jobs will emerge? Is there a plan? I don't see an economic strategy to accompany our climate fighting strategy. If the government knows where we're going, I have no fucking idea what it is. If you were able to shut down the fossil fuel sector today, and that's obviously an extremely radical thought, even over the next five years, um, which I don't think from an engineering point of view might even be possible. But, you know, if, if just to play out the idea, if, if, if you were able to do that, the cost to Canada economically and socially would be extraordinary. Every Canadian would feel it. There would be a loss of hundreds of thousands of jobs, a loss of billions and billions of dollars of revenue, not just for Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland, but for the federal government. Uh, our currency value would probably go down. We've done a bit of modeling about that here at RBC. Lots of assumptions need to be played into that, but you know, you're probably looking, depending on the point of the cycle, at a 60 cent dollar rather than an 80 cent dollar. And some of us remember what Canada was like when our currency was in, in the low 60s. Um, it was challenging, um, especially, you know, if you want to do anything with the rest of uh, the rest of the world. Uh, those are really serious consequences that Canadians need to be aware of, um, but it's not binary. So how do we ensure that we are helping this strategically important, even essential sector, and I say essential because most of our lives, daily lives, still depend on fossil fuels uh, in all sorts of ways we take for granted. Uh, how do we ensure that it can transition to net zero while continuing to produce uh, oil and gas particularly to meet the demand that is there in our country? And there's very little indication that Canadians are getting off oil and gas overnight. Uh, but also with our key trading partners, the U.S. first and foremost, the oil sands uh, gets uh, a lot of a, a lot of attention uh, in this discussion. Uh, importantly, so uh, roughly 10% of our emissions. But hey, that means 90% of our emissions come from somewhere else, including what you and me probably have already produced uh, today. 10% um, of our emissions. So if you shut down the oil sands, we're still going to be nowhere near net zero. 90% um, of its production, roughly, goes to the United States. So this isn't even about what you and I are consuming. This is sold to Americans. Um, if we shut that down, do you think Americans are going to stop using oil? Um, no, no, they'll get they'll it just easily from Saudi for more oil, right? Or Mexico, which uh, doesn't have a serious climate strategy. So where do we end up? Um, you know, that's not even on the other side of the planet. Uh, that's in <laughs> kind of long range driving distance of, uh, of Canada. Uh, we've just traded our way out of a strategic opportunity. And it's not just about the economic opportunity, about the money. What is really critical for Canada at this point in time is our opportunity to seize on the resources, and it's not just the resources in the ground, it's the human resources, incredible brain power uh, in, uh, in Canada on resource extraction, uh, some of the best in the world, uh, and, and it's sustainable resource extraction. So how do we seize on that brain power, on our financial capital, on our technology, and invest in that to create the opportunity 
opportunities, whether it's uh, blue hydrogen with, uh, with natural gas or carbon capture and storage in the oil sands. These things are already underway. This is not some, some, some thing sitting in a lab somewhere. Uh, if we can get behind these and scale it, we'll get our own net emissions down. Uh, so that's a critical win for the country. We will maintain uh, that economic strength, uh, which too many of us take for, for, for granted. And we have a real shot to scale this and make this a, an export opportunity for the, for the countries for the next quarter century, which has an economic dividend, but also, as we were discussing earlier, a huge climate dividend. This may be our biggest way to help reduce global emissions um, as well as our own emissions. All right. Okay. Since Confederation, owning a home has been part of the Canadian dream. For most people, that dream is much more than just a monthly mortgage payment. A home is where we create our fondest memories and where we can truly be ourselves. For too many, especially young adults, that reality is out of reach and it's getting worse. The good news is our original sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association, or RIA for short, has a plan to save the Canadian dream of home ownership. It includes lowering costs for first-time buyers, ending money laundering in the real estate market, and cutting years of red tape that is standing in the way of more affordable homes for families. The ARIA plan will lay the foundation for a future where all people can find a place to call home. When we support the dreams of all of us who want to own a home, we're building healthier families, stronger communities, and a safer, more secure future for all. Read their plan at aria.com backslash affordable homes. One last question on this topic, and it seems to me we can't talk about climate change without talking about what's happening in British Columbia right now. Places yeah. underwater, the Coquihalla Highway was broken in half. I can't believe that visual of that. Yeah. And John, it makes me wonder whether we aren't at a point now with a lot of climate effects baked in and with reason to be pessimistic about how active the globe is going to be, about how much we should be yeah. focusing our resources on adaptation versus fighting. Um, like, are we, you know, do we now need to look at all the ways in which we are extremely vulnerable to what is likely to happen? We are at a really critical point in time, David, in the debate between mitigation and adaptation. And right now there's a coalition, roughly, maybe alliance is a better word, globally that is committed to and investing in the transition. Uh, we know what the technologies are roughly. We understand the costs uh, and it's more of, of an investment opportunity than a cost. And we kind of know what to do. Uh, we, we did our re report, uh, the $2 trillion transition, um, which I'll just flag, you can get at rbc.com because uh, it outlines um, how Canada can invest $2 trillion, and most of that is private capital, by the way, um, inv from, from investors, but also from households, uh, to get us much closer to net zero. It doesn't get us all the way there. But we kind of know what we, we, we need to do, and this is an, an RBC discovery. There's lots of smart people out there uh, who we've leaned on for, for insights on this. Um, the same is true in the U.S. The same is true to a degree in China. Like we, we, we know what to do. We have the resources. We have the technology. Um, but if we don't move more quickly and more effectively, including showing real results and not blah, blah, blah to the voting public, I fear you're going to see a bit of a cut and run uh, political movement uh, towards adaptation where the world starts to say and political decision makers start to say, hey, we need to spend rather than on technologies, on getting people to transition to electric vehicles, we need to spend it on building, you know, uh, flood protection for our highways, uh, which will, um, uh, you know, continue to face the challenges that you have in BC. Now, it's not an either or. Uh, we need to be investing in adaptation because regardless of how effective we are, uh, the trajectory is such that there will be significant changes to our climate over the next 25 years. And we need to be prepared to uh, not only live with those, but to adapt uh, more sustainably 
to uh, to those. So we need both, but I think you've you've you you put your finger on what could be an interesting political tension in the years ahead, and you know maybe we'll see some political movements rather than climate deniers uh, start to emerge that that advocate for more of that um, uh, emphasis on adaptation. Interesting. Okay. Thank you for all that on climate change. I want to just quickly, because we're running out of time, switch topics and talk to you about uh, inflation and the cost of living. Um, I'm more interested in the household cost of living than I am in technical inflation rate. You tweeted a chart that showed meat, for example, rising on a 10% annualized basis. What's fueling that increase? And David, these are not separate topics. Um, I, I, I think inflation is going to be really important to to the climate conversation. But what's 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 driving these these um, uh, startling price increases and in things like meat? Well, supply chains. Um, you know, I was in a restaurant recently, and and the the the. Um, the server came by and said the, the following items are not available uh, tonight uh, from our menu due to supply chain problems. <laughs> wow, I'm hearing, <laughs> hearing about, <laughs> I'm trying to get away from the, the economist just for an evening and I'm you know, being lectured on economics yeah. by, my, uh, by my waiter. Um, your, but supply your, chain your, your waitress was Francis Donald. <laughs> um, <laughs> the um, so, you know, supply chain constraints Rates are are serious. They're real. They're affecting uh, um, yes menus uh, in, in in Toronto, but that's affecting the price of uh, of, of, of beef. Um, input costs uh, are are going up, and this is where inflation gets uh, much more concerning when it, when it's coming from multiple. Uh, variables or multiple uh, prices in in any equation. So what farmers are having to pay for all sorts of things, including labor, uh, is forcing them to push prices up. And there's demand. Uh, we're all out and about spending more. Um, and you, your show has been really good, including with Francis talking about what those uh, those reasons are. But hey, this this has a climate impact. Uh, we're spending more. And we're spending it on a lot of the same old stuff. Uh, and that's going to have an emissions cost to it. Um, governments are going to feel a need to respond to these cost of living pressures. And what tools do they have at their disposal to do so? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I know the conservatives tried to make cost of living a greater issue in the last federal election. Uh, you see what P uh, Pierre Polyev was trying to do on social media with it. And it just didn't kind of connect. But I think there's something there. There is, uh, and you see this a bit in the uh, kind of the, the messaging of the, uh, the Ford pre-campaign as well. Cost of living, the pocketbook. I uh, think I see it in Biden's decline in popularity too, by the way. Yep. Yeah. No. Good. Uh, good. Good. Good point. Um, so, cost of living is a basket, uh, and everyone's cost of living is different. But um, uh, and governments um, actually can't do a lot in the short term. Um, uh, we can talk about things that have been tried in the past uh, that have been effective or, or less effective. Um, but certainly, scaling back public spending is going to be important uh, because that has been inflationary. Uh, so governments are going to need to come to come to grips with that. Uh, well, wait a second. Allowing, what about Build Back Better? Uh, uh, it's got to focus on the build side, on the investment side, and not on income transfers, uh, which um, are were necessary in in uh, in many cases still are necessary, but ultimately need to be wound down. And as the pandemic eases and hopefully that continues through the winter, uh, we need to see that accelerate uh, so that it doesn't become uh, an ongoing inflationary pressure. Um, opening up the economy, uh, allowing, um, you know, lo loosening restrictions is also important. Uh, that helps with the supply chain, uh, some of the supply chain issues on things like labor, um, getting immigration uh, going again is uh, is going to be really important on the labor force side. Pretty much all or close to all of our labor force growth now comes through immigration. Um, so if we don't get 
back to uh, back to normal and actually increase that uh, gradually in the years ahead, we'll probably see more inflationary pressures. Uh, inflationary pressures there. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, 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 the big mover tends to be interest rates and governments don't have uh, near-term control over that. Although there's an interesting politicization of central banks in different parts of the world, including possibly in the United States, says, uh, you know, as they debate a uh, transition in Fed leadership um, that could have some political impact on, 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 on rates. But I'm not sure I know many politicians who want interest rates to uh, to go up because that takes a lot of uh, a lot of money out of the economy and creates no. that sense. But of, Francis told me it wouldn't even address level. the issue because it's not it's not a it's not a it, it's it's not a demand issue. It's a supply issue. Well, I I, I think it's both. Uh, and if if you okay. see rates go up, which we're expecting next year, on something you know as simple as mortgages, um, it just means less money. Uh, all of us have a bit less money every month because we're putting pay, paying more towards our mortgage payments than to go out to those restaurants or to travel or to buy uh, buy new clothes. And we're going to be a little less encouraged or more discouraged to borrow money to uh, to, to to do that spending. So it, you know, gradually it starts to uh, tighten up that uh, that demand side. Excellent. Listen, John, the hour has just uh, flown by. I want to thank you for taking the time to drop by and demystify some of these public policy areas for me and my listeners. Um, really, really interesting conversation. And David, uh, it's always great to be uh, with you. I, although I yeah, miss being in your studio me. with your, your your drum set because you did once promise to play Kashmir for for me, and I don't think you've uh, you've, you've been able to do that. So one day soon. I'm still not John Bonham. I'm still not John Bottom. I think uh, I think maybe I can pull off Wipeout. Yeah, <laughs> David. There will never be another John Bonham. So, like, no, that. there certainly will not be. <laughs> certainly will not be. Uh, listen, I'm going to be moving back to Toronto soon, and it will be great to see you in person. Let's make that happen. I look forward to it. Yeah, me too. Thanks a lot. Uh, I want to thank, th you. thank our presenting sponsor, Telus. Our sponsor, CN Rail. Our sponsor, the Ontario Real Estate Association, and I want to thank especially all of you Hurley Burleyites for taking the time to listen to John and I shoot the shit here for an hour. See you next week. Thanks a lot. Burley, 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 burley. Wow.